This is the Rate of Rise series brought to you by Keys to the Shop. Today we're talking with Phil Beatty of Delano's Coffee Roasters. Well, hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Rate of Rise where we have elevated conversations on roasting. This is a series on Keys to the Shop where we bring in experts in roasting from across the globe to kind of dive deep into relevant topics to help you become a better roaster, to understand roasting and really represent the coffee well in your art and craft. In this episode is brought to you by Roast Magazine, which is one of the longest running and most respected trade journals in the coffee industry. Roast Magazine offers articles written by scientists, subject matter experts, professionals from around the globe that will help you develop yourself professionally in your roasting business. And they are second to none in terms of curating this content. Not only are they producing this wonderful magazine, but they have produced many books on green coffee, on the supply chain, on roasting, and more. Check them out at roastmagazine.com. You definitely need to be subscribed to Roast. It is an essential resource for you as a professional to develop yourself and your company. Subscribe today over at roastmagazine.com. Well, everybody, I'm excited because we're going to be talking about a subject that I think is constantly being talked about in lots of different ways. There is a gap between what we prefer and the way we describe things in the coffee industry and the inner circles and what customers are looking for and how they describe things. And, and that gap might just seem like this innocuous thing, but really it can have devastating consequences for farmers, for how people perceive coffee, and for our businesses too. And so there was an article written by today's guest, Phil Beatty, all about this gap and what we can do about it from the inside to create a system that is a little bit more likely to produce an accessible and relevant, is something that connects with customers. And today's guest, Phil Beatty, has written an article for Roast Magazine about this gap and what we can do to address it and why we need to address it and how we can create a system and alter the system that we use internally to more accurately reflect what customers are looking for while still attaining high standards in the industry for the sake of the farmer and for the consumer. Now, Phil Beatty is the director of coffee for Delano's Coffee Roasters. He is an experienced coffee industry leader with over 20 years in roasting, sourcing, and quality control. He's known for his contagious energy, passion, and leadership, and he served as the uh, chair for the Roasters Guild, has been on international cupping juries, and has also been a certified Q grader. He had the privilege of roasting for two United States barista champions, once in uh, 2015 and the other in 2019. And I always see Phil at the uh, Coffee Fest events, and I've wanted to, you know, have him on the show, and we've kind of chatted here and there. We're kind of in each other's world peripherally, but now we got a chance to sit down and talk face-to-face about something that is so important and that Phil has an incredible amount of knowledge in and experience with because of just the way that, for instance, Delanos promotes and produces a great range of coffees and creates accessibility through those offerings. And Phil has been essential in that pursuit. And so through this article, he is expressing the desire for us to create and innovate a system that will answer the call of what's happening now in the industry, which is let's bring more people into specialty coffee. Let's close this gap and create a better system that will create better outcomes for everybody. And that's what we're going to talk about with Phil today. So I think you're really going to get a lot from this. There's certainly quite a bit that we can do within our own roasteries to start taking steps toward connecting with our customers and balancing the way that we pursue coffee to attain these high standards, but also to, again, connect with our customers in meaningful ways. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Here now is my Rate of Rise conversation with the Director of Coffee for Delano's Coffee Roasters, Phil Beatty. All right, Phil, welcome to Keys to the Shop. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. Oh, of course. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's funny. 
I see you virtually every coffee fest, I think, <laughs> and around the industry. And, you know, this is the first time that I've had you on the show, but I think we've kind of been, you know, dancing around like, okay, we're going to have Phil on the show. But, you know, it was that article that you wrote most recently about taste and the gap between customers' understanding of taste and, and how we're approaching it as an industry that was just like, okay, I mean, this, this really has to happen now. So I'm excited to get you on the show to talk specifically about this subject because it feels like something that you do very well. So I, I, let's just start with the idea in the beginning of how your own roasting career began and your philosophy on quality and and tasting and how it evolved to what it is today. I know that's a big ask, but you know we don't just fall fully formed <laughs> into who we are today. So, what was that evolution like for you? I'm super, you know, blessed and fortunate to kind of be living the American dream, so to speak. Un unlike I think a lot of folks in the industry, I've been with the same company my whole career, which is. September will be 23 years for me working at Ilano's Coffee Roasters. Wow. So it's it's a long ways back to remember the start, but I was literally 20 years old trying to figure out what I wanted to do with life. I actually wanted to be a chef. That was what I was targeting when I got out of high school. I knew I loved cooking, loved the creativity of it. I did a little bit of musician stuff, so I kind of had that artistic nature. And while I was trying to figure out how to be a chef, a friend of mine said, Hey, well, while you figure out what the path to that is, if you want to come work in the warehouse at the coffee roaster, we can use some help. And it took all of about a day to say, Hey, wait a minute. What, what are you guys doing with that machine? That looks like you're using flame and, and airflow and crafting something. And it sure seems a lot like cooking to me. Uh, <laughs> So I was, I was hooked literally, you know, day two, I was, I was bugging the people who were in charge at the time saying, Hey, you, you got to teach me how to roast. That was, you know, like I said, 20, almost 23 years ago, it was a very, very different landscape in the coffee industry in the U S at that time, there was much less information, much less, uh, availability of classes and, and access to information. And so it was kind of a choose your own adventure at that time and, and figure it out without a ton of assistance for a small roaster. So that was both challenging, but also super invigorating and exciting for me to, to feel like I was cutting my own path. That was the start of it. I really got into roasting first. I mean, that was, that was my sole focus was creating efficiencies. Delano's was a small, very small company. I think when I started, there was eight employees total. Now the company's up to over 110 employees. We were doing a really, really small amount of coffee in, in, in retrospect. And I was just looking at efficiencies, at quality. I dove into roasting as much as I could. And after just a couple years of of development of roast logs and and timing batches and figuring out consistency, learning how to cup coffee, implementing quality control programs. I really quickly, like most roasters, realized, oh, this is this is more about the beans that we're sourcing than it is about the the quality control as far as developing something special. And so that was that was when I got to make the leap into green coffee buying and eventually into the current role that I'm in as director of coffee, which is that nebulous title that basically says, Hey, you have your hands in, in all things coffee at this company. So. <laughs> right. Right. You got what you wanted. All things coffee. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's like, that's a good summary of 23 years right there. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> how can I sum it up in two minutes? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because when you started to take the path from saying, okay, it's about the quality control parameters and the techniques, which, you know, of course, those things are important, but then also about the quality of the coffee itself. And that obviously changed something for you in the way you approached everything else. I'm interested to hear about how 
that changed the way that you presented coffee to people along the way? Because I think back in the heady days of the late 90s and all that, you know, people were just really into coffee as, I don't know, it wasn't the same as today, but it was a lot of the dark roasted coffee. It was a lot of just not a lot of micro lot coffees and, and that kind of thing. But it felt like all coffee was somewhat similar. And so the proposition of marketing to people, what you had, seemed to be a little bit easier almost. But when you introduce higher quality green coffee, ergo higher prices probably, what kind of dialogue did this open up between what you were doing and the people that were buying what you were doing? It was a time where the traceability was was becoming huge now now that is almost like it's it's almost cliche to say the word traceability now but when i was starting if you single origins were labeled by the country that they came from and then you you were really advanced if you put the region within the country that it came from and then obviously when i started buying i was excited about the the whole concept of going directly to a farm and showing the people that were behind you know, even the faces of those people that were behind where this bean came from and highlighting the work that they were putting into it. And that was that was cutting edge back then. Now it's kind of expected. But that was a lot of the discussion was telling people, hey, this is the seed of a cherry and it's actually grown on a plant and it produces one to two pounds per year. And those type of things were were still novelty at that time. So expressing to, to customers that the flavor that they were tasting in a cup was actually the result of this intricate long chain of careful work put into it was, was something that was new and that, that, you know, transitioning from Italian and French roast to single origin and expressing the, even in blends, expressing what components were in that was new. Back then it was it was very secretive. Nobody said what was in their blend. It's like, that's my proprietary secret mix. And now everybody puts what what's in the blend on the package. So in the, those early days, it was just all about tasting. Our, so at Delano's, we have this signature blend that's called Dylan's Blend. It's a huge percentage of our business. And back in those days when, when Starbucks was king, I, I guess they still kind of are, but the Dylan's blend, which is, if anybody's familiar with an Agtron number, it's at about a 51 Agtron. And that was considered a light roast back then. Yeah. So that was kind of the differentiators. We were coming in with this blend and going, look, it's not, it's not black and oily. It doesn't, you know, the beans don't turn into a, uh, turn into powder when you squeam, squeeze them between your fingers. That was kind of fun. And now fast forward 23 years later, Dylan's blend is like on the verge of a dark roast in the industry. So it's kind of kind of interesting how those preferences shift. And I think that shift in roast profile is specifically tied to the traceability and and people wanting to taste the the origin of that coffee and when you roast it darker as we all know you're you're tasting less of where that coffee came from and more of the flavor of the roast. So there's a little bit of you guiding what people are looking for by telling them that this is what you're tasting. And then they're saying, well, now we want that. So give it to us. And we're like, oh, uh, glad you asked. Uh, here it is. And at the same time, there's a need to listen to what the people want beyond what you've told them to want, if you get what I mean. So absolutely, how is it that that has shaped the way that you've approached roasting, you know, so that as we talk about the gap between consumers and the industry, there isn't as big of a gap because there's a balance where there's communication kind of going both ways. Yeah. It's a give and take for me. I've, I've done thousands of tastings with, with coffee shop owners, mostly as we're a wholesale company. And I always just start the conversation by asking somebody what do they like? What do they normally drink? What are the flavor profiles that draw them to coffee? And then we can expand from there. So it's, so if they say they like a dark roast, well, I am not as a, especially as a wholesale coffee roaster, it's not my job to tell them dark roast is bad. It's my job to say, okay, let's discuss dark roast. Let's talk about 
roast profile and how long uh, coffee has developed and is there is there a dark roast that doesn't taste so great and is there a dark roast that actually has some some unique flavor characteristics that that you can enjoy and that always is that's always over a cup of coffee i mean you have to you have to be sitting with four or five cups of coffee next to each other and and comparing them side by side and i think that's where you in that article you were talking about that that's where i talk about styles and i'm i really think our our industry is desperate for styles instead of just saying hey this coffee is is not good because it's roasted this way let's let's define what a coffee could be at that level that's a process where again it's that give and take so rather than just blatantly just telling somebody sorry you're wrong you don't know coffee you, you you explore it and you say okay what do you like about that you know if it's if it's a strength thing some people say oh i like dark roast because it's strong and it's then okay well can we achieve strength in other ways can we achieve the the viscosity that you're looking for or the punch the intensity of flavor in other ways and still highlight a supply chain that that's rewarding to everybody along it where do we go off the rails here what you just talked about sounds very idyllic in the sense that we're just like looking into each other's eyes, consumer and roaster and saying, what do you like? And let's explore this together. Let's just, let's go on this journey together. It feels a lot more, you know, like there's glimmers of that happening, but then there's just a lot of chaos and other kind of inputs that go into this, like industry competition and all, all sorts of things that can kind of muddy the waters. So how do we kind of mess up the way this good communication should be happening to create the gap that you are kind of writing about? There's so many different ways that it can be go astray when having those conversations. I think a big one is just when people, whether they're a roaster or a coffee shop or a barista or anybody, when they fall so in love with their own product that they close off the possibility that something that's different from their own product is still has still has redeemable value in it. Mm. And that is, you know, people will call that being a coffee snob, but it it really is like this this fierce brand loyalty to the point of saying that anything that's different from what their product is is quote unquote bad. That's kind of that level of judgment that I get really uncomfortable with. I would much rather somebody just say, hey, this is what I prefer. It's having that open mind that people have different preferences while still leaving a path to refining those preferences and refining their taste and getting more and more specific with what they look for without feeling that they have to shame other, other coffees in order to make their point what's at stake here? I mean, why is that important? Don't we owe it to our brand to be loyal, to, to be bombastic and make marketing claims so that we drive more business to buy more of our coffee? Yeah. I, I think what's at stake is, you know, an example would be if you go to a, a lot of industry events, but let's say you go to SCA and everybody's pushing anaerobic fermented coffee and saying, this is the pinnacle yeah. and this is the peak. So all roads should lead to anaerobic fermented geisha. And that's where it's like, okay, but now we've created, if we as an industry get so aligned as insiders that this is the pinnacle and this is the peak, and we have somebody who's coming in from without that experience, and maybe they're just, maybe they're somebody who drinks a 24 ounce caramel macchiato you know as they call it <laughs> and now we serve them this pour over of a anaerobic fermented geisha and it is completely different and we say this is what good coffee is and now they feel condescended to they feel they're they taste it and they're like this is just sour this is sour it's to them it's not coffee this is not what coffee is and here we are as an industry screaming from the hilltops that this is the pinnacle and this is the best. And so my opinion on it is that 
we can spoil that experience and lose that customer forever. And that customer now says, okay, you guys are, you guys are crazy. I'm not going to go to the grocery store and buy an $18 12 ounce bag of coffee because I had this experience once. And if that is what the pinnacle is, I don't want your $18 bag of coffee. I would rather just go to Costco and get the $12 two pound bag. And so it's, it's kind of like this, when, when we create this either or situation, we lose the consumer to a better experience of coffee. And of course, for me at all, as a coffee buyer, all of this comes back to creating more equity across the entire supply chain. So I want somebody to understand that there is a virtue in buying an $18 or a $24, whatever it is, an expensive 12 ounce bag of coffee that is virtuous. There's, there's a supply chain now that's, that's sustainable. We use that word sustainable. Well, sustainability starts with the economics. And so when they are willing to purchase a more expensive coffee, then the entire coffee industry around the globe benefits from that. If we ostracize them right off the bat by telling them that this is what expensive coffee tastes like, and not leaving room for other products, other flavor profiles, then we we risk losing that person and having them just think it's a joke that you know we're, we're, it's the emperor's clothes clothing story. You know, let me just kind of push on this a little bit and say, don't we want to have some exclusionary? part of what we do as to say, this is specialty, this is different. There's a difference. You know, the, it's not as cheap as a two pound bag of coffee from Costco. It is different. And because of that, there is a gap automatically. And is the elimination of all gaps, the goal, or is there, are there gaps in, you know, between one type of coffee you could buy and another type you could buy or the way we describe things that are necessary, but others that we just kind of invent that are unnecessary. Yeah. I I think it's about intentionality. I don't think that exclusivity has to be so, so specific. And, you know, I think there's obviously, as I said in the article, I think competitions have led to this mono this this mono flavor of what's good now of course any i've judged competitions i've 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 supported competitors and i i understand that somebody who's a real a real coffee aficionado is going to say well these different espressos that are being served at a competition or pour overs if it's brewer's cup they all taste very different but that's to somebody who's tasted ten thousand coffees to somebody who's only tasted 50 coffees they all taste pretty much the same So I think there's a way to protect exclusivity and and say, yes, we we need to have exclusivity when it comes to when it comes to freshness, when it comes to traceability and transparency in the supply chain, and when it comes to describing flavor profiles and roast profiles, that is what can make something exclusive is the specificity of how we describe it and how we brew it. But it's not necessary, but I think we go a little bit too far with that specificity. We want consistency though, and we do need systems just like between batch protocols and all the things that kind of help people trust us. So we want to, especially when there's a lot of money on the line, when you do like auction cuppings and other things that you do in your position, you travel the world for these things. There is a system in place that in and of itself, it's going to produce a result in one direction or another. And so it seems like adjusting the system to create less of a gap in more range with less specificity is in order. But how is that not antithetical to having systems in the first place? Like what's the balance between systems and then systems that produce something that has flexibility and range while also having a high standard. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to look at the, the consumer and what I, I group consumers into two different categories. There's people who coffee is a ritual to them. They do it at the same time every day. They, they drink the same 
coffee or drink every single day and they have comfort in the fact that they can get consistency that they get the exact same thing every single day and it's it's part of their routine and then you have this other group of consumers that are experimenters they want to taste something different when when the coffee shop brings in a new coffee they're the first ones that say oh i'll try that and so I think it's important to look at the psychology of those two different groups and be able to have a multifaceted approach to how we communicate and how we present coffee to those two different groups. And at the end of the day, there's people that want sweetness and there's people that want acidity. They're different. And so saying that acidity is better than sweetness, which I think is you know even if you look at our score sheets if you look at the the you know sca is coming out with a new score sheet but the old score sheet was heavily weighted towards acidity i get like certain organic acids will present themselves as as sweetness but inevitably if you go to these competitions as a as a judge whether it's cup of excellence whether it's barista you know us barista championship whether it's brewers cup the it's like the lowest bar the easiest way to get consistency as a judge is to just recognize these more sharp citrus like acidities and score them up and if you're tasting if you're a judge and you're you're tasting 20 espressos by the time you get to that fourth or fifth espresso the way that the coffee presents itself to your palate is one that favors something that's more has more of a sharp acidity to it mm. and and so that's inevitably if you want to win a competition you you have to find something that is going to punch through all of the other coffees that somebody's tasted and that's where you enter the, the anaerobic fermentation where you've got these like intense you know raspberry yogurt cranberry pomegranate just super super light roast too so now you're now you're looking at roasts that are like i mean some of these coffees and competitions are just barely touching first crack and that you can hear the grinder chattering as it tries to grind up these coffee beans and the the flavors that come through are very very sharp very intense and so again, that's that's where, okay, if we create that as the pinnacle, like, okay, who won the World Barista Championship? What coffee were they using? And now that is the pinnacle. And that's where I say, no, that, that was the pinnacle for that competition. But in reality, if, you know, when I have people come in, my most popular coffee that I've been tasting with people in the last year has been uh, this really uh, like super rounded, chocolatey, honey process from the Pacayal mill in Honduras. And this coffee is just so over the top with the sweetness and the, it's got butteriness, it's got pastry character. I always say it's, it's kind of like a cinnamon roll minus the cinnamon, you know, it's like just all these like really great flavors. If you serve that at a barista competition or at a cup of excellence, it's going to disappear because it doesn't have any sharp notes that are going to cut through the judges cut through and make an impact on the judge's palate right and yet if i have consumers coming in not industry people but consumers coming in they think this is the greatest coffee they've ever tasted and it's not a two thousand dollar a pound coffee we're entertaining ourselves yeah yeah we're you know basically just looking at each other and seeing who can do the best trick with coffee and it's an insider thing that consumers are not really allowed into, especially, and it's interesting too, but it's very disingenuous that the context, the specific context in which that particular coffee won, the whole, you know, binder full of, you know, how the playbook of how to get the points for that competition is boiled down to, this is the best barista, this is the best coffee. And we allow that narrative to eliminate all the context, all the detail, because the end product, you could argue, is being disingenuous. Almost like we, we want people to don't ask us questions about the exact 
you know, things behind it, this is the best coffee. When in truth, if they knew that it was just so extraordinarily subjective, even in its specificity, they it, it wouldn't have the weight. The media of it wouldn't have the effect. It, do we need these things in order to promote good coffee? So is it just a necessary evil to have these competitions? I don't know if I would go as far as saying necessary evil. I So to give some context, I've roasted for the U.S. Barista Champion twice. So first in 2015 for Leila Gambari, and that coffee that we roasted, her and I went to Emilio Lopez Diaz's farm, uh, Finca Cuatro M down in El Salvador, and we, you know, cupped 60, 70 different coffees as they're coming off of the drying patio, and selected them. You know, did the whole the whole thing that that people do to to chase that championship. And it was amazing. Like the experience is amazing. The, you know, when she won, Emilio and I are there watching her win. It was, it was an, like, it was the best, it was the best moment of my coffee career. One of the best moments of my life was, was seeing Layla hoist that trophy. And she was an amazing professional. And she was somebody who completely 100% understands the, the, broadness of the coffee industry and knew exactly what she was doing. And she would tell you she was playing to the points. She read the rules, every single sentence, every single letter and maximized her point opportunity. Mm -hmm. Right. But then there is this like trickle down of, of dialogue that comes out of that, where it's like, there's this kind of people drinking their own Kool-Aid of this, this is the, the epitome. And again, it's when, it's when people start saying this specific coffee or this specific process is the pinnacle. And that's when I go, ah, I don't know if that's, if that's how I would phrase it. It may be the pinnacle for this competition circuit because of the way that the game is played. But that's where I pull back and I say, we have to really be careful about saying this is the pinnacle. And we do that with score too. So we say this is a 98 point coffee. And then along comes, you know, this, I gave the example of the honey process Honduras coffee is like a 85.5 point coffee. You know, Q grader would rate it about 85, 86. But my, but to my customer, they rate it a hundred. <laughs> They're like, this is, this is, this is the pinnacle. So I think we have to leave room in the conversation for these other these other opportunities for flavor exploration. And in when I roasted again uh, for Sam Spillman, who actually trained under Layla and then worked for Delano's, and she was our trainer when she won the U.S. Barista Competition in 2019. And for that, we went to La Palma El Tucan in Colombia. We got the you know the 80 hour anaerobic fermented geisha that was incredible. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to shame that coffee. That coffee is something amazing. It sparkles. It's, it is anybody who cups that coffee or tastes an espresso is going to say, wow, this is something special, right? It's when that transitions from saying this is something special to saying this is the pinnacle and this is what we should be driving all consumers to that I that I start backing away. And that's why I wrote I was inspired to write that article for Roast because I really think we as an industry need some sort of structure, some sort of unified system that creates categories, that creates types, so that we can not judge everything against one scale where the most acidic fruity coffee is the is the top. This is what the beer industry does. So for about 10 years, I was a home brewer, brewing my own beer at home and was a like a self-professed beer geek. And I went through the beer judge certification program that was run by the Craft Brewers Association. And I was blown away by the complexity of their grading system that I think it's 42 different types that they have. There's a porter, there's a Baltic porter, there's stout, there's a nitro stout, there's different types of amber ales, there's, you know, the um, like people always say, oh, look at, you know, if you look at Coors Light or something and somebody's like, ooh, I don't like that. 
Well, they don't say that that's a bad beer. They say that that's an American lager. And they have a two-page description of what the pinnacle of an American lager is. And it includes color, viscosity, head retention, the, and then flavor components that are acceptable and flavor components that are frowned upon for that style. And so nobody in the beer industry is pointing at a hazy IPA as the pinnacle. Now, that may be the most popular beer during a given time period, but nobody's, nobody in the beer industry is saying, that is the best. We need, to, we need to stop doing stouts and porters and start doing only hazy IPAs and charging the, charging the most for those. And I think there's something that we could learn as a coffee industry from that and just provide platforms for more coffees to have their own peak, their own pinnacle of that particular style. So purposefully providing context in a system for context where it it seems pretty loose in that no one's actually saying literally, and maybe a couple of people, but this is the best and you should only buy this. But it's assumed and it's allowed to kind of run rampant in the assumption. Yeah, yeah. It's the negative space around the message. And so defining that negative space is akin to bridging that gap. Yeah, yeah. And beer is like, I love this beer analogy because the like a stout or a porter literally is a dark roast. They're taking <laughs> barley and roasting it dark. Yes. And the flavors that you're getting in a, a stout or a porter are dark roasted flavors that are very much parallel to a dark roasted coffee. I keep saying dark roast only because I feel like that is that is the the one area where that's kind of like just really frowned on by our industry. It's not I for full disclosure, I'm not a dark roast person. I don't like dark roast. But I want to make room for those people in the industry. Yeah, and and there's a lot of them, you know. I have some kind of a soft spot for a a good dark roast, basically, just because of you know being in the industry since the that late '90s period is very nostalgic. But the beauty of the industry is the variety that you have to choose from, and making that choice a little bit more clear for people without making them feel like they've you know betrayed one of the rules of the coffee gods or something. It feels pretty important. And something else that I I think I would like your opinion on here is the time frame in which we produce changes to the standards that have downstream impact on farmers. So if the SCA introduces new protocols for tasting and standards, it's been years and years of developing farmland to produce according to the pre-existing standard that cannot just be changed on a dime although consumer preference seems like it can change a lot easier, obviously, than the farm itself. So what's kind of a responsible cycle of making adjustments to things that have an impact on a slower moving and much more consequential part of the the chain that is the farm? The old saying is that every coffee has a home. So a coffee farm can, or, you know, farm, mill, they can produce the full spectrum of qualities. And of course, as a green coffee buyer, quality is much more tied to the physical. You know, you're tied to moisture content, bean size, defects or lack thereof. And so at a farm, you really are going to succeed most when you can do sorting. The better a farm is at sorting coffee, the more profitable they can be because now they can maximize their exposure to the different levels of quality that are traded. A classic example is um, going, I've been to a farm in Brazil that produces 5,000 bags of coffee a year. Their target, a really, really great, great year, is when they get 10% of that production at scoring over 80 on on an SCA scoring sheet. And so if 10% is quote unquote specialty, they're excited they work completely off of a post-harvest sorting. So they, they strip the tree completely of all the cherries, overripe, underripe, and ripe. And then they use, they rely on the dry mill, the wet mill to a certain extent, and mostly the dry mill for sorting those coffees out. And that's how they achieve efficiency of scale with their, their production. If you go to a farm in, in Guatemala 
they're literally the exact opposite. So they're, if they can get 90% of their coffee as that specialty grade, then, and only 10% as below, whether it's prime or commercial or the grinders that get sold to instant coffee, that's a good year for them is when 90% is specialty grade. And so their focus is less so on, they may be slightly less sophisticated on the sorting and much more on hand picking and selectively harvesting the ripe cherries, which is going to yield the most specialty grade. So I think that's where, first of all, I don't, as a coffee buyer, I don't go to mills or farms and assume that I'm the expert and I need to let them know how to do their job. They are the expert and I want to learn from them. And so all I do is just act as a communicator. If I visit a really incredible farm that's doing amazing things, I will share what I see there that's not proprietary. And I'll share that with other people and say, hey, this, you know, I may be talking to a farmer in Colombia and sharing what I saw in Costa Rica. And if that helps, great. If it doesn't, that's great too. And then, you know, just keeping that open dialogue between a producer and a roaster is is so important and then being there year in and year out and saying hey your coffee scored 86 last year this scored 84 this year i'm still going to buy it like these these are conditions that are out of your control the weather the the weather being the biggest one and so i think that's that that synergy and that open line of communication and and loyalty is really important so it sounds like having these kinds of rhythms in relationship will help balance against the desire to chase trends to hedge your bets if you think we need to change all of our trees to this particular kind of you know, coffee tree or yeah or process yeah the i mean the the biggest thing lately has just been process where last year specifically there was my phone was ringing off the hook with people trying to sell these natural fermented micro lots because it's been overdone. The, de the demand, the production of them far outpaced the demand for them globally. And then it turns into issues with consistency where it starts affecting this, this, the standard quality shipment where, as an example, last year I had a, a, a lot of coffee and I won't just say who it was from or what country, but the lot came in and one in about 10%. So one in 10 cups, I would get this weird peppermint flavor and upon which was not necessarily, it's not a, it's not a defect. It's not a mold. It's not a musty cup. It's, it's, it's something that was like, okay, this is kind of interesting, but also off. And so upon further discussion with the mill that it came from, I found out that in my 320 bag lot of, you know, standard 84 point blender coffee, they had mixed in 20 bags of, of uh, anaerobic fermented natural that they couldn't find a home for. And they thought that this was, they literally said, well, this, this is increasing the cup score of that coffee. Oh boy. And I was like, I don't want an increased cup score. I want the consistent, my customer is not looking for one in 10 cups to have a peppermint flavor. They just want it to taste, you know, in this case, it was supposed to just be a classic chocolatey, you know, balanced 84 point coffee. And, and I, ha I, I had to reject it because I was like, I can't, this is, my customers will not be okay with my customers that are part of that consistency group that want the same cup of coffee every day they are not going to appreciate it when when they get a peppermint cup and that was that was like a huge learning process for them huge learning process for me but those are the risks of of that can happen when when we knee jerk and overproduce on some unique flavor profile that then now now where's the home for that coffee back to the every coffee has a home well every coffee has a home within reason if if you're producing something that's really really unique it ironically that that over fermented coffee should have been blended in with the grinders that were going into instant coffee and maybe then it would have been okay man well it's something we created the idea that that was something that was a value and the 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 vagueness around that idea 
is born from the vagueness around our own standards. Yeah. And so that, that idea that you could have these relationships where you're in constant communication, then also introducing types to a system, uh, like you were mentioning, that's going to help people looking from afar say, oh, well, what they mean is within this type, that's desirable, but they still value the things that we produce. So we don't have to do an about face. We don't have to get desperate with our processing methods and, and try to chase this or else we lose everything, which is unfortunately, I think what we tend to let people think and for our benefit often, and we just kind of wink at the collateral damage. Yeah, totally. So let me ask you this as we wrap up here. I think, you know, it's one thing to say, well, these large systems or these things that maybe not all of us participate in, in terms of these international cupping panels and the like, we have roasteries, some are small, some are larger. How can we take the first step to bridge the gap between this insider coffee industry way of kind of pursuing entertaining each other with, with taste descriptors and things and the consumer who, who just wants a good cup of coffee, what's the first step to bridge that gap in a way that satisfies them, but also helps us know that we are promoting coffees that do have a high standard. It's specialty and it's virtuous. I think the most important thing is relationships. And my good friend and colleague, David Griswold from Sustainable Harvest was kind of the one who coined the term relationship coffee. And in that case, that was all about the relationship between buyers and importers and producers at origin. But I think that relationship also is really important that it extends to the, to the coffee shops and to most importantly, to the consumer, the person who's coming in drinking that cup of coffee and just having those dialogues and, and really starting, especially with understanding the difference between subjective and objective and that somebody's preference and like for a specific coffee is subjective. But if we can create uniform descriptions for different types, that can be something that can be objectively measured. And the more objective we become with our description of different types of coffee or different types of roasts, the better we're able to meet a coffee drinker, a consumer with their subjectivity. And their subjectivity of coffee should be encouraged and embraced. And we are better able to embrace the consumer's subjective tastes if the more objective we are with how we grade and, and describe a coffee. And I think that's, that's where I really hope we can figure out how to progress the dialogue around types. And there's a really, you know, there's a fine line between easy and lazy. And we want to find ways to produce coffees and roast coffees and describe flavors that can, can come across as effortless. But at the same time, without, without trying to make shortcuts and, and go into lazy decision making, which is I don't want to, I don't want to take on this describing or this further development of different types, because it's just a lot of work. And I, I think that's, you know, that's universal is wanting to put in the work to create something that's really special and intentional. That's what we're here to do. I think. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad that you wrote this and, and have brought this up and this dialogue is happening. So, and thanks for coming on the show to talk about it here. And I want to know where people can go to learn more about maybe things you've written, just follow you online, get some of that Honduras. Tell us all about it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Obviously, Delano's.com, you know, that's easy to go to for and the Honey Central is that Honduras coffee. It's a really fun one. And then you can find me on Instagram at Just Roaster is my uh, coffee Instagram. Excellent. Well, Phil, great to have you on the show. And thank you again. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. All right, everybody. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that. And I so appreciate the suggestions that Phil has for how we as an industry can 
evolve and mature. And I love the beer analogy that he was making as an in industry, it's time, it feels, that we would acknowledge and create systems around types and categories so that we can promote within context certain coffees rather than you know this singular coffee being so amazing that it's the the pinnacle and we've all seen in the industry for paying attention that can have some pretty devastating consequences and actually just leads to more confusion than clarity which doesn't really help us in our marketing it doesn't help the customer get something they'll love the onus is on us as professionals to evolve the way that we communicate as our industry evolves. So I'm really thankful for Phil and his ideas here, and I hope that we do collectively take up this challenge, and you can do so within the context of your roastery. And collectively, I hope that that happens as well. So huge thank you to Phil for joining us on the show. Go check out Phil's work and the coffee that he roasts over at Delano's. Dot com. And of course, you can read that article over at roastmagazine.com. Be sure to subscribe to Roast Magazine as well. Awesome resource right there. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback about today's episode, always feel free to email me, chris at keys to the shop.com. And with that, it is the end of today's Rate of Rise series for the month of June. I hope you all really got a lot from that. Don't forget to check out all the other Rate of Rise series episodes. A lot of them can be found in the show notes. I link to quite a few of them usually. But if you just want to go to the website, keystotheshop.com, you can search for Rate of Rise. And all of them will just pop right up and you can do a deep dive into roasting from there or search the term roasting it's just as effective so anyway thanks again everybody and as always i hope that today's episode has truly given you keys to the shop